Hello and welcome back to the channel where we are reviewing the uh, Salvador's textbook structure in architecture. So this video is about chapter six and the uh, name of the chapter is tension and compression structures. So uh, we are going to discuss a few things um, that those are cables, cable roofs, trusses, uh, funicular arches. So let's dive uh, deeper into the chapter. So the most elementary of all structural elements and the most easily understood is the simple tension cable. So cables have been used for thousands of years, beginning with the form of simple ropes made of natural plant fibers and animal hairs to the present day, where the properties of advanced materials have been made the long span bridges of the modern world possible. So the high tensile strength of steel in particular combined with the efficiency of simple tension makes a steel cable the ideal structural element to span large distances. So uh, in um, the uh, tensile load in the cable, uh, is evenly divided among the cable's strands, permitting each strand to be loaded to the same safe allowable stress. So this behavior makes cables so singularly most efficient structural form possible. All of the material of a cable can be effectively used to carry loads, and there is no possibility of buckling. Bridges with single spans longer than a full mile are now common due to the combined strength of steel and efficiency of pure tension. So please, um, as always, refer back to the textbook. So there is a beautiful image of the uh, Akashi Kaikyo Bridge in Japan. Um, so, um, and there are a few uh, different characteristics of the cable. So, the uh, triangular shape acquired by the cable is referred to as the sag. The vertical distance between the supports and the lowest point in the cable. Without sag, the cable could not carry the load. We see from the vector free body diagram or FBD uh, here in the textbook that without this sag, the cable tension forces would need to be horizontal, but purely horizontal forces cannot balance a vertical load. So this would not fulfill the requirement for linear equilibrium in the vertical direction. So the inclined pull of the second cable on each support may be split into the equivalent of two components a downward force equal to half the load and the horizontal inward pull. So due to the horizontal action of this inward pull, if the supports were not fixed against horizontal displacements, they would move inward under this action and the two halves of the cable would become vertical. So please uh, take a look at the symmetrical load on the cable and internal cable force actions. That, uh, that's um, how that works. So for a symmetrically loaded cable, it's evident by uh, inspection that half of the total load is carried by each support. So, and uh, you can see it there. So, um, and there's also a variation of cable thrust with SAG. There is a beautiful graphical representation of force vectors that are drawn in proportion to the force magnitude and direction. So, um, a simple experiment can uh, actually bear this out. So if the header holds a thread in each hand and attaches a weight at the middle, one may sense physically that the string develops no horizontal pull when the fingers are touching, while an increasing pull is developed as the hands are moved apart, thus decreasing the string sag. So the pull may be shown to be inversely propor uh, proportional to the sag. Uh, reducing the sag by half, in fact, doubles the pull. So in, uh, you can uh, experiment with that and actually see how that works 
in uh, reality. So, and also there are the diagrams of the optimal SAG. So uh, please refer to the figures here. So um, if the load is shifted from the mid-span position, uh, because of its flexibility, the cable changes shape and adapts itself to carrying the load in tension by means of straight sides of different inclinations. So the two supports develop different vertical reactions, but equal horizontal pulls since the cable forces must always be in equilibrium in the horizontal direction. The value of the horizontal pull differs from the value for a centered load, but still varies inversely as the sag. So, and um, uh, there can be different shapes such as the parabola or catenary, and you can see the those are the uh, funicular curves. That's how they develop. So, um, and let's take a look at that uh, in detail. So as the number of loads on the cable continues to increase, the funicular or string polygon acquires an increasing number of smaller sides and appro uh, approaches a smooth curve. If you apply an infinite number of uh, small loads to the cable, the polygon would become a funicular curve. For example, the funicular polygon for a large set of equal loads evenly spaced horizontally approaches a well-known geometrical curve, the parabola. And you can see it there. So also, um, if you um, remember the Golden Gate Bridge, uh, that is a classic suspension bridge. So smaller suspender cables are hung from the main suspension cables, which are anchored by massive blocks at either end. And the suspender cables support a deep stiffening truss, which carries the weight of the roadway. So without that stiffening truss, the roadway would continually flex with shifting weight of the moving vehicles. So, um, and you can see uh, there are a lot of different structures behind all the engineered um, inventions. So um, also um, stiffening trusses are usually rigid in the direction of the bridge axis, but less so in a transverse direction. Large displacements of suspension bridges caused by lateral winds can be substantial. So the long roadway and the shallow trusses constitute a thin ribbon, so flexible in the vertical direction that it may develop a tendency to twist um, vertically under steady winds. So um, in so-called stayed bridges of the harp and fan type, um, the uh, stays uh, or wires have the double role of supporting the deck and stabilizing it. So their elegance and economy has made them popular for middle range spans. Uh, for example, um, following the extensive destruction of European bridges during World War II, rapid reconstruction of the highway infrastructure was critically urgent. And cable state bridge design progressed rapidly in the years following the war, since they were both economical and capable of being constructed more rapidly in comparison with similar spans using suspension designs. Uh, and again, a few examples. There is the Senator William Roth Jr. Bridge and then the Clark Bridge um, in um, Alton, Illinois, uh, and also Malau uh, Viaduct here. You can see there are um, different examples that is uh, in Southern France. So, uh, also, please take a look at the suspension bridge anchorage, how that works. And there is a diagram here and um, also the 
uh, formula to calculate that. So please take a look at that. And we are moving to the cable roofs. So the exceptional efficiency of steel cables suggests their use in the construction of large roofs, such as sports stadiums and transit terminals. So the relatively recent um, development has brought about a number of solutions in which tensile cables are the basic element in what may otherwise be a complex structural system. So the relative flexibility of cables is a primary consideration. And there are numerous design approaches in which uh, each of the different aesthetic qualities and fit with the architectural requirements. But each design solution is essentially aimed at stabilization of the cable system. Uh, you can definitely take a look at the images here and you can see the David Lawrence Convention Center in uh, Pittsburgh, how that has been constructed. Uh, the suspension bridge principle was directly adopted in the structure design in uh, 1961 by Mervyn uh, Cover for an Italian paper manufacturing plant. Uh, the structural scheme was an ideal fit with the architectural program because of their linear nature of paper making process. So you can see there is um, actually a beautiful image showing that and uh, it was proposed by the engineer and then it was incorporated into the design. Um, also, you can see uh, here uh, an, another example, that's the um, Dallas Airport Terminal in Virginia. So that is uh, actually similar in structural principle to nervous paper mill in Italy, but consists of multiple parallels, parallel cables. Uh, so please take a look at that, how that has been designed. Also the um, David Ingalls hockey rink at Yale University. That is a very interesting structure. And we see that the central con concrete rib supports suspension cables that are anchored by a curved perimeter concrete wall. So since the roof is lightweight wood, in order to stabilize the cable from uplift, upward arching stabilizing cable run perpendicular to and above the suspension cables along the length of the structure. And there are also a few variations for um, aesthetic reasons. So you can see how the stabilizing cables and um, primary suspension cables and compression arches are used um, and the combination of um, both. So also the, um, there is another example, the uh, Cylindro Municipal in Montevideo, Uruguay, that was, um, simple cable supported roof structure. And that is the uh, innovation um, that was to hang wedge shaped tiles on cables with gaps in between. So that's another uh, way to actually construct things. And also uh, it's a multidisciplinary project. So architects collaborate with the engineers and the constructors so they can uh, sit down and discuss the feasibility of the project and uh, come up with some innovative solution. Also here you can see the uh, Oracle Arena. Uh, that is um, another example, uh, you see the perimeter functions as a compression ring, which is supported on a diagonal grid work of perimeter columns that provide lateral and torsional stability, which is really interesting to see. You can see the suspension cables there. You can see the perimeter compression ring there and the central tension ring. So, and the structure is exposed. So it's always good to see how that um, has been designed and constructed. Um, also, uh, there is another example um, 
maintenance hangar at Philadelphia International Airport. So um, that is a large column free space. And using the cable straight principle, this structure achieved a tremendous span with minimal materials. So the um, a counterbalancing anchorage of which the front of the structure cantilevers is 125 feet. So that is um, a long span. Uh, then uh, take a look at the uh, Pan uh, Am World Port Terminal at JFK Airport. That is a, a similar principle applied to the cantilevered roof structure, uh, and that's the hangar. So you can see that the roof of this building was constructed as a radial cantilever from a central ring. So and it was considered revolutionary when it was um, opened in 1960. Um, a few other examples, beautiful structures, beautiful uh, pavilions and sculptures here, for example, uh, here, um, uh, this uh, Tensegrity sculpture in Washington, D.C., how that is connected. You can see it's, um, it's just uh, a compilation of compression members, so they do not contact one another. They're just... Um, hanging on the cables there. Also, there is a bridge in Brisbane, Australia, uh, the uh, Kirilpa Bridge, and that's the pedestrian bridge uh, with a main span of 394 feet. And this is the world's longest bridge to use the principle of tensegrity as its primary structural system. So the design, um, and construction was done by um, the engineering uh, firm Arab. Um, also, what else is important to see here? Uh, there are uh, the tensegrity domes as well, and they can span up to 800 feet. For example, um, the first of, uh, of those ones was used in St. Petersburg, Florida, and that covers a circular stadium with a seating capacity of 43,000 people. So, and the diameter is 680 feet. So you can see how that has been designed. And um, this is a beautiful example of structural and civil engineering. Um, so, um, yeah, that is the Tropicana field in San Piet. Uh, also, let's take a look at the pneumatic roofs. Um, they present one of the most interesting applications of cables to the reinforcing and stiffening of membranes. So they consist of air supported or air inflated plastic fabric stretched over a network of cables and can span hundreds of feet. So this is quite interesting. And um, um, sometimes uh, they, uh, people say that that is the, the future of the uh, structural systems. So please take a look at La Plata Dome that's in Argentina. And um, that is a, an extension of the um, Geiger principle of, uh, by engineer Mathis Levy. So, um, and um, we are moving to the trusses. So let's take a look at um, the trusses. The structural stability of this basic cable system requires that the ends be fixed to support uh, to supports that prevent movement of the cables. If one support, for example, um, were in the roller, the tensile pull on the cable would cause an immediate collapse by horizontal movement of the roller. Uh, if instead a wooden strut is placed between the two supports, this horizontal movement will be prevented and the tensile force will be balanced by compression within the strut. So, and this is the simplest form of the structural type known as a truss. 
The triangular shape described by the cables and compression strut is referred to as a panel. Larger trusses described below are multi-panel trusses. The outer structural elements of the panels are referred to as cords of a truss. In these initial examples, the cords are horizontal, but sloping cords are common as well. So another example here, you can see the hanging cable, you can see weight on cable with roller support uh, and tensile uh, truss with compressive strut. Uh, consider that the structure that is created by inverting the original cable structure and strengthen its inclined sides to make them capable of resistant compression. The negative sag or rise changes the nature of the stresses and the inverted cable becomes a pure compressive structure. Again, uh, take a look at all the uh, graphics here. So the load at the top of the truss is channeled by the compressed struts to the supports, which are acted upon by downward face uh, forces uh, equal to one half the load and by outward horizontal thrusts. By inverting the structure, therefore, all of the forces are exactly equal in magnitude, but opposite in direction to the original tensile uh, truss. The horizontal thrust of the inverted truss can be absorbed either by compression in buttresses or a material such as stone, masonry, or concrete, or by tension in an element such as wo a wood or a steel tie rod. Uh, and again, you can see the compressive arch here. Trusses capable of spanning large distances by means of members that experience only tension and compression forces with no shear or bending behavior like beams and are obtained by combining multiple elementary single panel triangular trusses. For example, if two of the most basic triangular trusses are joined uh, at an upper joint, they cannot support a load unless a tensile bar prevents the verticals at the bottom from moving apart. And again, refer back to the images and see how that works. You can see the two disconnected truss panels. You can th see the three panel truss and you can see the conceptual development of a multi-panel uh, truss. Um, if the smaller truss is itself supported by a larger cable and strut structure than a longer span truss of six panels is created. Uh, and you can notice the doubling up of the compression member of the top cord and that is reflective of the increase in force in this member. Please again, refer to the images that will be so much easier to understand. You can see here, there's a truss with tensional diagonals and other images. Um, the combinations of tension and compression bars capable of producing practical trusses are extremely varied. And you can see the Warren truss here, and you can see the Gable truss. So there are variations. And please refer to the joints, how that is connected, how um, uh, the plates, the, the gusset plates are um, actually helping to connect. So that is a means of physically connecting members while transferring large forces between them. So those plates may be used in a decorative manner, such as um, heavy timber truss shown uh, here um, in the textbook, and that's being how that's being fabricated, or it may be hidden within the member thickness in so-called knife plate connections. So only the bolts are visible on the outside of the members. Um, and sometimes even these types are 
countersunk in the holes plugged for a completely smooth appearance. So there are different variations here. And again, another example here, there's the fourth railway bridge at the um, Firth of Forth in Scotland. You can see the um, trusses here. And those trusses can span hundreds of feet between supports. So, and they may be cantilevered from piers and in turn carry other simply supported trusses. So, um, uh, another example is here. And you can see the parallel core trust roof. Uh, that's um, how that is constructed. You can see an open web steel joist. So, and for the most part, those are um, pre-manufactured trusses because that is definitely easier to uh, do that off-site. Uh, and we are moving to the funicular arches. Uh, there is a little bit uh, about them as well. We need to remember what that is. And, um, we spoke a little bit about that um, in uh, different chapters and at the beginning of this video as well. So um, those are pure funicular forms introduced um, uh, a long time ago. So um, those were heavily used by the Romans and they could span large distances. Uh, for example, an aqueduct supported by a series of semicircular arches survived today in uh, Segovia, Spain. You can see there is a picture of that. So arches are also used in a variety of shapes to span smaller distances. The ideal shape of an arch capable of supporting a given set of loads by means of simple compression may always be found as the overturned shape of uh, the funicular polygon for the corresponding tension structure. So, and um, uh, this is the method that the Spanish architect Antonio Gaudi determined the form of the arches in the church of the um, Sagrada Familia in Barcelona or the church of the sacred family. So, um, the funicular polygon for a set of equal and equally spaced loads converging toward or diverging from a common point is a regular polygon centered about the point. Uh, please take a look at different bridges here as well. The Roosevelt Lake Bridge in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, and also the Roman aqueduct here, the, the one that we spoke about in Spain, uh, that is still um, in good shape even today. And you can see there are different polygons here, the compression polygon, tension polygon, and tension circle. So those are um, different shapes. And that was it for chapter six. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you in chapter seven.